Well, greetings and welcome to Trinity Bible Church, everyone. My name is Bill Gauss, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you here for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Uh, we we trust that uh, you've been enjoying our study in First Peter, and uh, this evening we'll be looking at First Peter chapter three, verses ten through seventeen. A uh, lengthy passage uh, on um, uh, some more practical lessons for the church. And um, we, we, again, trust that uh, you've been edified and uh, are being sanctified through these lessons. And uh, it's our desire to uh, uh, keep on encouraging everyone through these uh, videos on YouTube uh, during this pandemic. And it's probably something that we're going to continue doing uh, even after we are um, allowed to uh, once again meet as a, a congregation at the church. Um, so uh, those of you that are uh, going to continue um, uh, to lock yourselves away um, due to the, the virus, and uh, we totally understand that, uh, just so you know, we're planning on continuing these things, uh, albeit we'll be doing it live uh, so in the next uh, couple of weeks, we're hoping to be able to meet again uh, beginning on the 14th of June, uh, according to uh, Governor Murphy. And uh, thereafter, uh, you can tune into this YouTube channel. Uh, as our services begin, we will be uh, putting them on our YouTube channel in a live format uh, for all of you to see and, uh, of course, worship with us. Uh, it's a little different than Zoom, of course. You won't be able to uh, communicate back and forth, uh, but nevertheless, you'll be able to see uh, everything going on uh, at the uh, in a live setting uh, as we as we have the service. So we trust that you'll join us uh, for that uh, if you're unable to uh, be with us physically. Uh, we definitely want to uh, make sure that you're uh, continuing. Uh, uh, to uh, study along with us. All right, so again, tonight we're looking at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. Uh, before we get into uh, reading, let's, uh, let's ask the Lord to bless our study. Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, in spite of all of the hurt in our society today, we know that you are uh, still God. We know that you are sovereign over all of these things. Uh, we also know to an extent that... Uh, all the things that are happening are a result of your judgment on our society and on our country and the world at large. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be salt and light in this dark world. Uh, help us to be arbiters of peace. Help us to, be, uh, to pursue that peace, uh, as we'll see tonight in our study. Um, Lord, it's uh, very important that we... Um, uh, uh, exude um, uh, basically what I'm saying is we, we should we should hurt with those who hurt and uh, rejoice with those who rejoice of course that being the church uh, but Lord as we deal with our unsaved friends and family and co-workers and society at large uh, Lord uh, I pray that you would uh, give us a, a spirit of um, uh, understanding and um, but yet a uh, spirit of resolve uh, to know that uh, it is um, righteousness that we are to seek and uh, uh, godly things that we are to seek, not carnal things. Um, Lord, I just pray that uh, you would help us to uh, say the right words um, because of our study of your word um, and be... Uh, uh, ministers for your kingdom. Uh, Lord, thank you for the platform that you give us, give each and every one of us. Uh, I pray that we would uh, be good stewards of that platform. And uh, Lord, thank you for our salvation. Thank you for uh, being who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, again, we're in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. Let's read that together. For... He who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. 
And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Uh, so tonight you will uh, see that I will um, um, be addressing that last paragraph, uh, and, he who, and, he, uh, and who is he who will harm you, uh, and continuing through the end there, verse 17. Um, I will be dealing with that in a roundabout way, uh, although I may return to that next week. Um, although uh, I, I haven't necessarily planned on doing so, I just recently today had some thoughts about that um, particular passage and uh, uh, think I may um, turn around and, and, and say some extra things next week about it. Um, but for now, uh, let's, uh, let's get down to it here. Uh, Peter's just gone over the principles that tell us how to relate to one another in the church. He did that in verses 8 and 9. Uh, we're told to be of one mind, and we're told to have a compassionate heart. Uh, we are to love with a tender heart, and we're to be courteous. We're not to return evil for evil or reviling for reviling. And now he concludes the section by citing the Old Testament. Uh, it's mainly from the Psalms. Uh, and he begins, he who would love life and see good days. That's verse 10. Uh, and tonight we're going to look at the content of this citation, and we're also going to examine uh, the literary structure of that passage. Uh, I hope that we might be, uh, in doing so, that we might be uh, instructed by it in a way that would be useful to us when we come to uh, passages that are like it uh, uh, throughout Scripture. So the Bible teaches that we are not to hold on to the things of the world, uh, but we're to set our hope on eternity. We're supposed to look beyond the borders of the world and remember, as we've been saying, we're to remember the heavenly inheritance that has been preserved for us. Uh, at the same time, we are not to despise or waste the life that we are given uh, in and on this world. Uh, when Paul was being um, uh, was torn between being with the Lord or staying here on earth and ministering, he said this, I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Uh, and that's coming from Philippians chapter 1, verses 23 and 24. I bring that passage up to point something important out. Uh, it might be something that some of you already uh, have already noticed. Uh, Paul, wasn't Paul wasn't wrestling with good and bad. Uh, his struggle was between good and better. Okay? Um, we're told to love life. Uh, speaking about his mission as a whole, even Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Uh, from John chapter 10, verse 10. Um, we might think that it's unnecessary to remind people that they should love life. Uh, I mean, we, we do everything we can to stay alive and to pass on a legacy. I mean, look what we've done during this pandemic just to stay alive. Um, but that's only part of the story. Uh, I've said many times that I don't know how believers, uh, I'm sorry, how unbelievers go through life without Christ. It's truly a hopeless existence. On the other hand, we have Christ, and we also have hope. Uh, so we should cultivate a love for life within our souls. Uh, and then there are others who seem to have this ongoing love affair with life. Um, the, uh, uh, the excitement and the optimism that they have uh, about each day is 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 nothing more than contagious because they communicate uh, a passion for living life to the fullest. Um, that is the way we are supposed to be as Christians. Um, we have a tendency to define our existence in this world in terms of good days and bad days. I had a good day at work or I had a bad day at work. 
Uh, but every day should be a good day because, as Christians, we are in touch with the Ancient of Days, who is also the creator of new days, right? Um, good days. Uh, Peter applies his, his admonition to loving life and seeing good days with a quote from the Old Testament. Uh, it says, Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Uh, verses 10 and 11. Uh, to get a little deeper into this passage, like I mentioned before, I'd like to point out and explain the structure of this phrase. Um, this phrase is a couplet. Uh, it's it just it means it's two statements, a couplet, two statements. Um, there's no real difference from uh, be, there's no more there's no real difference between refraining a tongue from speaking evil and refraining lips from speaking deceit. Um, this is a common literary device uh, that was used everywhere in Jewish literature. Uh, it was and is still used primarily in poetry. Uh, the Bible's wisdom books, such as Psalms, Proverbs, and the Song of Solomon, have a large, large number of passages that are in poetic form. Uh, in English poetry, we often use rhymes to create a certain kind of meter, uh, but the main form of Hebrew poetry is something called parallelism. Again, that's parallelism. Uh, there are several kinds of parallelism in Hebrew poetry, but there are three main types overall. Okay, uh, There is synthetic parallelism, synonymous parallelism, and antithetical parallelism. Uh, synthetic parallelism, uh, parallel, parallelism excuse me, is structured so that several verses uh, are set on top of each other and build toward a conclusion. Each line draws from various elements in order to create a synthesis from the information. Uh, synthetic parallelism is a bit difficult to uh, distinguish in the text, um, and this form of poetry is, is not used very often, uh, especially when you compare it to the other two forms. Um, synonymous parallelism happens when two statements of a couplet say the same thing in two and sometimes three different ways. Uh, the most well-known Jewish blessing uses synonymous parallelism. Uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you uh, and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. From Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. Uh, I used to be able to say that in Hebrew. Um, all three statements communicate the same idea. To be blessed by God is to have him make his face shine upon us. To be blessed by God is to experience his lifting up the light of his countenance upon us. And when we are blessed by God, we experience God's preserving us. He keeps us, and when he keeps us, he doesn't do so because we deserve to be kept. That's an expression of his grace. Uh, when he keeps us, he is being gracious to us. God's grace was given to the Jewish people, particularly through God's giving them peace, as a nation, that is. So, uh, and as well as individuals, of course. Uh, so all three stanzas are virtually synonymous. Antithetical parallelism is very common. Uh, we find it in statements that uh, have... Uh, that, that have contrasting ideas. Uh, for instance, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Um, that's an example of antithetical parallelism. Um, that's from, of course, it's from the, the, the famous Lord's Prayer, but James writes that God tempts no one. Excuse me. Since it's absolutely clear that God never tempts anyone, why would we ask God not to lead us into temptation? The answer is found in the rest of the couplet, but deliver us from the evil one, uh, which is the exact opposite of being led into temptation. Uh, it's a real shame that many English translations mistranslate that verse, and they know it, by the way. 
Um, they do it because of tradition. Uh, it's been recited wrong for centuries, uh, but it continues because of popular demand. Um, nice way of saying tradition. The original text does not say deliver us from evil. If it did, that would be evil in an abstract sense, and being abstract, it would require uh, the use of a neuter gender. Uh, but the term evil in the Lord's Prayer is in the masculine gender, so its proper translation is actually this. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from Tao Panerao, which is the evil one. Uh, and I hope you remember where you've heard that title, because it's the title the New Testament gives to Satan. Jesus encourages us to pray that the Father will not do to us what he did to Jesus, that he will not expose us to the direct assault of the devil, but instead deliver us from the evil one. Um, you might also remember what Paul tells us to do when someone in our church refuses to re repent of a serious sin. Uh, we're to excommunicate that person, uh, which means that that person is given over to Satan with the hope, of course, uh, that restoration can occur. Uh, and that would be because of the, the anxiety that they experience from being in the world and, and at the, the uh, being under attack from Satan at all sides. Uh, this should also remind you of Job. Satan came into God's presence after uh, what the Bible says he was walking to and fro on the earth, and he bragged about the failures of the human race. Uh, God said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? And in a cynical way, Satan re 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 responded, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. That's the point of what Jesus tells us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. We are to ask the Father to put a hedge around us, to surround us with his protection and keep us from the attacks of the evil one. However, when we recognize the antithetical parallelism in this phrase, we can better understand how this particular prayer is nuanced. Um, these statements are also found all through the book of Isaiah. Have you ever had someone tell you that the Bible says God created evil? Uh, they use this verse uh, to prove it, and they're saying, like, quote, unquote, prove it. Uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7 says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Yeah, on its face, it seems like it's pretty much uh, saying that God created evil, right, and creates evil actively. Uh, but it's obvious that this verse is a clear form of antithetical parallelism. Uh, so if you want to understand what is meant in the first part of the couplet, again, you have to understand what the second part is saying. Uh, even though there are eight nuances to the Hebrew word for evil, when Isaiah says that God creates evil, he's not talking about moral evil. Uh, throughout the book of Isaiah, God is essentially saying that he is the one responsible for everything that happens. Uh, when we recognize the parallelism in that verse, we can clearly see that it never once suggests that God creates moral evil. Um, if you want to love life, if you want to see good days, then reframe your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. The Bible talks a lot about the evil that comes from our mouth. Uh, when Isaiah saw the awesome majesty of God, uh, he, him, he saw himself in, in stark contrast and pronounced an oracle of doom on himself. He said, woe, am me, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. Uh, the first thing that Isaiah confessed when he saw the holiness of God was 
what was coming out of his mouth. And he recognized that he was part of an entire nation of people that had dirty mouths. Um, with our lips, we are called to bear witness to the truth of God and to speak praise, honor, and glory to God. But instead of that, often, very often, too often, we speak slander and we blaspheme God. With our mouths, we stab our friends in the back. In his epistle, James talks a lot about this little member saying, See how great a forest a little fire kindles. Paul quotes the Old Testament. He says it this way, There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Romans chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Um, many snakes have sacks of venom in their mouths, and their front teeth are like syringes uh, that inject that venom when they bite their prey. Uh, the metaphor the Bible uses to de describe the mouth of fallen human beings is a snake. Uh, we have venom in our mouths. If only we would learn to love life and to see good days, we would have to learn to restrain those tongues. Uh, the specific evil that Peter has in mind here is the evil of deceit. Um, Satan himself is called the father of lies. Uh, John chapter 8 verse 44 says that. Uh, there is no truth in him. He makes his living by deceiving and spreading falsehoods. Uh, using lies, he does everything he can to undermine the truth of God. When Pilate asked Jesus whether he was a king, Jesus said, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. A Christian is defined by Christ as someone of the truth, and we should guard that truth with our very lives. James chapter 5, verse 12 says that our yes should be yes and our no should be no. Um, and that simply means that people ought to be able to trust what we say when we say it. Um, as we restrain our tongues, we lie less frequently. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. This is another couplet that expresses, once again, synonymous parallelism. Uh, what is said in the first verse is reinforced in the second by saying things that are virtually synonymous. Uh, we are told in the general sense in verse 11 that someone who would love life and see good days is not only to restrain his tongue, but he is also to turn away from evil. Uh, this is a metaphor of turning, right? Paul wrote, they have all turned aside. They have, to, uh, they have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Romans 3.12 uh, The basic pattern of unconverted human beings is to walk along the path of this world. Um, that way of traveling is actively turning away from God. Uh, Peter tells us that if we want to have a good life, then we need to turn in the opposite direction. We need to turn towards God. Uh, we have to turn away from evil rather than go toward it. Um, notice, however, that not doing evil isn't enough. We are called to do good. Uh, it is good to be accused of doing good because that is what we're called to be. We're supposed to be known as those who turn away from evil and do just that. Good. All right. Peter reinforces this idea by saying, let him seek peace and pursue it. Uh, this doesn't mean that we're simply to be peaceful. We are to look for peace and our search should be a passionate search for peace. Uh, that kind of seeking should come from a heart on fire, uh, literally on fire to gain peace. Um, seeking after peace involves pursuing, and pursuing something means to chase after it. 
So we're supposed to seek peace by actively pursuing it, not simply, uh, uh, not simply trying to stand in the way of it, right, or in the way of 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 war and everything. We are to chase after peace. Jesus also says, "Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God." Matthew five nine. Um, the peace we are to seek is the peace of Christ. It's the peace of God. Um, and of course, there is a false peace, and there are false peacemakers. Uh, I've, I was watching a lot of shows uh, about World War II on the American Heroes channel over the Memorial Day weekend. Um, Adolf Hitler, and my goodness, what, what heroes in, in, in all of the wars. But I'll tell you, it just never ceases to amaze me, the, the accounts of specific battles and occurrences uh, uh, in the theater of war. It's, it's, it's unreal uh, what uh, these men and, and, and in modern cases women are capable of doing. Um, but getting back to, to uh, our passage here, Adolf Hitler... Uh, one said to his colleagues, we can lie to the people now because after we're victorious, they will forget it. Neville Chamberlain went to Germany to pursue peace with Hitler. Uh, upon returning home, Chamberlain said, we have achieved peace in our time. And at the very moment that he was making that announcement, Hitler was getting ready uh, to blitzkrieg. To, 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 he, was, he was mobilizing his blitzkrieg. Uh, the Bible warns us about a certain kind of peacemonger, uh, someone who seeks a peace that is the carnal sort of peace, uh, and that's peace that lacks integrity. Um, this is the kind of peace that was common during Jeremiah's day, uh, the kind of peace that made God say, they have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Jeremiah 6.14 There is such a thing as false peace. At times, we don't want to rock the boat or disturb the peace, but no one ever disturbed the peace more than the Prince of Peace. That's Jesus' very presence provokes spiritual warfare. We are to seek peace, but it is to be a godly peace, not the peace of the flesh. Verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Uh, this couplet is also synonymous. Uh, in the first phrase, it says that the eyes of the Lord are watching his people. His eye is upon us. Uh, it's not an angry eye. It's a tender eye. Uh, his eyes lift us up. His eyes... Uh, are on the righteous, and his ears are open towards their prayers. Um, when children don't want to hear what someone is telling them, I know from my daughter, uh, she has started to do this. They put their hands over their ears. Um, this is almost the same image uh, from what God does. God puts his fingers in his ears when the wicked speak, uh, but he listens to the prayers of his people. Uh, James says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Uh, it avails much because God inclines his ear to hear the prayers of his people. Uh, this particular section of the passage ends with what we would call a politically incorrect statement, especially today. Um, it's a radical thing today to say that we shouldn't encourage godless people to pray. Because the prayers of the godless are an insult to God. And what do I mean? They insult God because their prayers don't come from contrite hearts. Instead, they come from hearts that are self-interested. They think God is like a heavenly genie, the man upstairs. They rub the proverbial genie's lamp and wish away. God shuts his ears to that kind of prayer, and he turns his face away from the unrighteous. When Israel fell into apostasy, God said, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fatted peace offerings. 
Amos chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. God is not mocked, and he's not interested in listening to the prayers of those who are insincere when they address him. However, if you pray to him with a penitent heart in a spirit of worship, he can't wait to hear everything that you say because the prayers of his people are a delight to him. We are to be people who love life and see good days, but we have to watch our mouths and we must turn away from evil. We have to seek peace and pursue it, knowing that God is very interested in hearing the righteous person and he wants to pour his blessings on his people. These are the practical things that Peter tells the church in the first century. It certainly was a church that was well acquainted, uh, well acquainted, uh, acquainted with uh, suffering. But it was also a church that had a, a, an unquenchable thirst for the glory of God. And that's what we're called to. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our, our Wednesday night Bible study. Like I said, uh, uh, next week I may go over this next portion speaking about uh, always be ready to give a defense. Um, and uh, we always must be ready to, uh, we, always, we should also know God's word well enough that we are able to, using uh, while using God's word, shut the mouths of dissenters. And uh, those are some of the thoughts that I may uh, indeed share with uh, you next week. Um, but, of course, uh, that's another study. And um, we hope you'll return uh, next Wednesday here at 7 o'clock to continue our study in First Peter. And uh, we also hope that you'll join us on Sunday mornings for our Sunday school class that begins at 9.30 and our morning worship service that begins at 10.45. Um, again, we are delighted that you're here with us uh, watching on YouTube, and uh, we hope that if you're a visitor that you will uh, come out and see us uh, when we're able to gather once again after this uh, pandemic um, lockdown is lifted. Um, we, uh, as a church, we desire to um, uh, be submissive in all things if we're able and uh, so far, we, um, we believe that God has called us to um, uh, obey these, these uh, rules that are handed down by our, specifically our governor right now. Uh, but that's not to say that we um, haven't uh, do our due diligence and, and have prayed at length uh, to that end. And uh, we, we do indeed have all uh, intentions on being in the building on June the 14th. Uh, so we hope that you will pray to that end. And uh, um, again, if you're not able to join us in person, of course, this uh, YouTube channel will be live uh, during all of our services, uh, Lord willing, of course. Uh, well, let's close in a word of prayer, and um, uh, I'll uh, bid you good night. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this study with all of the civil unrest and, and uh, just wackiness, uh, for lack of a better word. Uh, going on in our society today, uh, all the riots and looting. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, a, a spirit of peace, uh, that you would bring a spirit of peace uh, to our nation. And um, uh, of course, though, Lord, we also pray that your will be done. So if this is indeed judgment from you, we pray that uh, you will not relent until uh, that uh, judgment is fulfilled. And, uh, Lord, we just pray for your grace and mercy upon your people and upon uh, as many people as you, uh, 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 you would see fit here uh, in our society uh, to give that to. Uh, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the solace that it brings to us in, in studying it, knowing that you are fully uh, in charge and um, seeing all things come to pass for your own glory. Uh, Lord, we do glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. And again, we hope to see you um, first on Sunday morning for Sunday school and again next Wednesday night at uh, 7 o'clock for our uh, Wednesday Bible study. God bless you.